So that was a special briefing by Ministry of External Affairs. And to discuss more about this, I'm joined uh, by Mr. J.S. Mukul, who's been the former Indian Ambassador to the Netherlands and Consul General of India in Munich, Germany. A very good evening, sir. Thank you so much for joining us on uh, DD India Live. Now, talking about the strengthening ties of India and Germany, how do you look at the developments which are taking place today, which uh, are about to unfold tomorrow also? And today, if we talk about particularly many sectors have been touched upon right from trade to FTA focusing on migration mobility. Green hydrogen has also been talked about. And not only this, the conflict in the West Asia and the Russia-Ukraine conflict has also been discussed. How do you see this developing tie between India and Germany so far? Well, thank you for having me. Um, I think it's a very important and seminal visit of the Chancellor that is taking place in the mainly in the context of the IGC, the intergovernmental, the 17th intergovernmental consultations, which is, as you would have heard, is a whole of government bilateral engagement. And I think uh, we were watching the press conference of uh, the foreign secretary. I think there was hardly any area that was left out. Also, it is very important because while India, the timing of it, because while India and Germany have been strategic partners since 2000, we are entering the 25th anniversary of this partnership. And also, Germany being an economic and technological powerhouse in Europe, we are also, I think, celebrating the 50th year of uh, Indo-German uh, science and technology partnership. Now, all these things make it very opportune. And I think it is very heartening to note that on the German side, they have brought back the Asia-Pacific Conference, the APK 2024, to India after more than a decade. I think, again, in this framework, more than 650 top business CEOs and others as part of the CEO forum were present today. So I think this is the setting, and not to forget the defense cooperation, which will happen tomorrow, which you referred to. Uh, this is a three-day visit started yesterday and will go on till tomorrow when the chancellor goes to Goa. And we have two German naval ships, the Baden-Württemberg, Frigate Baden-Württemberg and the supply ship uh, Frankfurt and Main, visiting uh, Goa on a port call as part of an Indo-Pacific uh, Pacific, uh, deployment which then takes the ships to Southeast Asia and beyond. So I think if you look at the overall framework, it is while the Chancellor has been a regular visitor and the, the two leaders, uh, Honorable Prime Minister and Chancellor, have been meeting regularly, I still think this is a, a very important visit, hmm. which you could also see from the outcomes. Now, if you look at just very briefly the outcomes of the discussions, hmm. uh, 18 agreements were referred to have been signed. Eight of them were exchanged in the presence of leaderships. And these are very far-reaching agreements. Like, for example, the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty uh, in criminal matters. Now, that will lead to, uh, that will help facilitate the counter-terrorism cooperation and in terms of handling uh, cr other criminal activities. Similarly, there, is the, there has been further focus on other areas, science and technology was mentioned. Uh, now, science and technology, Germany, as I pointed out, is a technological uh, giant. And as part of this focus, a lot more is proposed to be done. In fact, the Honorable Prime Minister, in his speech at the APK 2024, summed it up, I think, by saying that this strategic partnership is now becoming uh, is being strengthened further, is becoming comprehensive, and I think it provides a new momentum to Indo-German relations going forward. Today's discussion also uh, touched upon the defense cooperation aspect. How uh, do you look at that and how do we assess that in the, uh, in the light of India's position at the Global Forum right now? I think it's very important, uh, both in terms of the uh, optics uh, while India and Germany have been having naval exercises, I believe, since 2006, the timing of the visit of these two naval ships and in context of the Indo-Pacific strategy of both India and Germany, I think there's a lot of, uh, lot of uh, uh, similarity there. Uh, they both view the Indo-Pacific as a region that should be free and open 
and that i think is the message coming along strongly through this of course there will also be uh, discussions there would have been there would have been discussions in the I, I, igc with regard to other areas uh, in fact if you if the public speech of the trans uh, of the chancellor at the apk 2024 he also referred to uh, airbus supplies and other other specifics that that are that are happening with regard to cooperation in the field of security and defense going forward particularly as well uh, from the IGC to the Asia Pacific conference multiple domains have been touched and if we talk about uh, all of them these includes IT labor R&D defense and skill which we briefly discussed now if we talk about trade particularly India and Germany's bilateral trade was valued at 33 billion dollars in the year 2023 itself what sort of a boost are we expecting from today's bilateral with migration mobility being a key point here sir I think the two German documents that have been announced, of course, these are German documents. One is focus on India. I think it is the only the second country with which Germany has ha has entered into this kind of a, has uh, has laid out this kind of a strategy. And the second document was the skill manpower or skill labor strategy. And India there, I think, is the is the very first country with which Germany has laid out this kind of a document. Now, both these augur very well for our economic uh, and commercial cooperation. Yes, you're right. Uh, the bilateral trade is 33 billion. Uh, I personally think there is a lot more scope. And these two uh, documents or strategy documents which the Germans have put forward will help take this forward. In addition to that, there has also been a clear expression by the Chancellor uh, at the APK summit in his speech there that uh, Germany supports the uh, EU-India FTA uh, as soon as that is uh, those negotiations start. And I recall the Chancellor clearly saying that we can, if uh, given the political will on both sides, and this can be wrapped up in months rather than years. Uh, so I think uh, these are very, very positive signals on the economic and uh, commercial side. Plus, there is also the German investment angle. There is a cumulative investment, I believe, of $15 billion uh, in India, the German investment. And that also, I think, will uh, get a boost because the focus on India strategy also uh, signals the support of Germany to India's make it, uh, to the to our own make in India strategy, and I think the confluence of those two will really help in taking our economic, commercial, trade, and investment relations forward. And when we talk about trade and uh, investment and the relation between both the countries, FTA is a very important part because that has also been discussed upon. German Chancellor today also said that he strongly favours India-Germany FTA, saying that Germany has become India's most important trading partner. And on the other hand, before that, Commerce Minister Piyush Goyal also said that respect is important to expedite the FTA process, which will be of mutual benefit. How, ac according to you, can it actually benefit both the countries, especially India's market penetration, in the European Union sector, you see, uh, it is it is it is a no-brainer that uh, FTAs today are becoming popular. We need access uh, to the German market, and also Germany Germany uh, surely aspires for greater access to the Indian market. Uh, the the so I think an FTA in whatever form it can come about, uh, whether. Uh, that will be dependent on the negotiations that take place, which are actually yet to resume uh, or restart. Uh, but I think an FTA per se will add a lot of value. You also refer to the mobility and, uh, and labor because the second strategy which has been spelt out is the skill labor strategy by the, by the German side. And I think as part of that, under the earlier mobility, uh, the, the mobility agreement, uh, this will be further strengthened. I think there was a clear reference to the need for talent in Germany, uh, and uh, obviously India is uh, is has is uh, well endowed with uh, talent uh, of our professionals. There was also in uh, the data provided that the Indian diaspora or the uh, number of Indian professionals, students, skilled workers has reached uh, a quarter million 
or two and a half lakh, uh, lakh figure, which actually has doubled in the last four or five years, showing the kind of momentum and growth there is, of which, of course, there are 50,000 students. Hmm. So I think all this, again, augurs very well for the increased cooperation in terms of uh, mobility uh, and migration, uh, in, uh, particularly with regard to professionals, students, etc. And so when we talk about it, adding to their talent pool would definitely increase our talent areas also that will help somewhere in strengthening the Make in India initiative also, don't you think, sir? No, absolutely. I mean, uh, it's always a two-way process. Uh, when our uh, professionals and students uh, go to Germany, and uh, Germany is, we know, very strong in technologies, and a reference has been made today uh, to science and technology in general, but particularly to critical and emerging technologies. I think that's a very strong area where both sides uh, would be. It's a win-win for really both sides in terms of uh, science and technology uh, movement. It's altogether been a 360 degree approach uh, today via all these engagements, meetings and forums. And now let's talk about environment also where green hydrogen has been touched upon. India and Germany together unveiled a roadmap on green hydrogen and this comes ahead of COP29 which is scheduled to take place next month. Where does this place India in line with its COP commitments? Sir? Well, the COP commitments stand on their own, but as you know, India is one of the few countries that is meeting its uh, COP, uh, uh, at least uh, one of the few of the larger countries or major economies which are meeting its uh, COP uh, commitments and not just meeting, but I think we are in many areas ahead of that. So this uh, new initiative of uh, hydrogen uh, initiative, the Green Hydrogen Initiative, I think is most welcome. And not only that there will be cooperation in the field of green hydrogen, but I think the German side clearly indicated that they see India as emerging as a hub. So that again links up with the, oh, make in, the point about make in India, which you were making. If India is to emerge as a, as a major uh, hydrogen, a green hydrogen hub, I think that also augurs very well uh, for our bilateral cooperation. And I think uh, not only for the bilateral cooperation, but also when we see India in the global context, it's going to be uh, of uh, a huge benefic benefic beneficially. Uh, this is going to really, you know, add on more to the country when we talk about India's strength in environmental aspects and uh, mission life, you know, it's been appreciated at global levels also. And this one particular thing that has come from the German Chancellor also add to its overall strength today, does, isn't it? Absolutely, I think, and uh, we will of course wait for the COP uh, meeting to be held, but I think uh, this will also, I believe, uh, find some reflection there uh, going forward. But uh, COP, as I said, on its own merits, India is uh, very much on course for meeting and exceeding its renewable energy targets under in COP, be they for solar energy or for renewables in general. Now, next year, India and Germany are going to celebrate uh, their Silver Jubilee of uh, India-Germany strategic partnership. And in that context, when we talk about the Indo-Pacific, that was also touched upon uh, in today's meeting and exchanges at the press uh, event, Prime Minister again said that security cooperation is a sign of growing trust. And their stand on freedom of navigation also emphasizes the common need for rule of law, which is to be followed, which was agreed by both the ministers. What sort of a message will it send to other the stakeholders talking about the Indo-Pacific region and uh, other parties involvement in it? Well, I think our position has been very clear on this, uh, on the uh, Indo-Pacific or oceans, uh, India's ocean strategy. Uh, we stand for a free, open, inclusive uh, sea lanes of communication, uh, navigation under the international rules uh, as uh, epitomized by the United Nations, the UNCLOS. Uh, the UNCLOS document or the UNCLOS or rules based uh, navigation. Now, the Germany, it seems, is also on the same page and they are also signaling a similar message. Uh, so, that is, I think, again, as I said, a great confluence. This also helps uh, in terms of uh, reinforcing the, the Indo Pacific uh, strategy of uh, open, free, and inclusive uh, oceans. And I think uh, the visits 
uh, the symbolic they may be, uh, but these naval exercises and visits in this context are the signal to all in the region. Uh, there, was, uh, there was, of course, not a related subject, but I would also like to refer to the triangular cooperation uh, hmm. in this context, because uh, on the development side, I think that was another major, major announcement uh, which was made that India and Germany will be, will be entering into a triangular cooper cooperation with regard to Africa. I think the countries Madagascar and Ethiopia were referred to. Now, as we all know, triangular cooperation is, is a, in its classical form uh, would mean that uh, a developed country, a developing or emerging country, cooperating together with regard to providing development assistance or projects to third countries. So I think this is, again, a very good example of, uh, of uh, triangular cooperation uh, between, uh, of course, it is an example of Indo-German cooperation, but it is actually in the trilateral or triangular uh, framework. And also somewhere strengthening voice of the Global South that has been uh, India's top agenda, one of the key agendas rather. No, absolutely. I mean, that uh, is an underlying theme, I think, that comes through uh, across everything, whether it's on the climate and environment, whether it's on resilient supply chains, whether it is now on in terms of, and this more directly in terms of the triangular cooperation, where because there India and Germany will be cooperating for these projects uh, with, the, with regard to identified African countries. In fact, it was also pointed out that they have already had three pilot projects earlier, and these two for Madagascar and uh, Ethiopia are the ones which were agreed to uh, today. And overall, this uh, discussion, I think, would be incomplete if we don't talk about uh, what Prime Minister once again reiterated uh, on the ongoing conflict and the geopolitical tensions. India has once again reiterated the importance of dialogue and diplomacy. And that was a very strong point of G20 New Delhi declaration as well. And which was uh, that uh, at that time, uh, Olaf Scholz was also a part of it. And today also, Olaf Scholz agreed to the same. German Chancellor said uh, and called India rather as the anchor for peace. How do you look at this developing situation and India's strong position when we talk about the geopolitical tensions and India's consistent stand being, uh, you know, uh, sorting out, attaining peace through dialogue and diplomacy only. I think India's position on this issue has been very clearly and consistently stated, uh, including uh, today. I think the world is world knows that India stands for peace for resolution of these uh, ongoing problems in different parts of the world that are happening today uh, with, with regard to dialogue and diplomacy. I think that message has been very clear. Today, it is very, very uh, heartening to hear the Chancellor say that when he referred specifically to the Ukraine problem, uh, the Middle East and other uh, areas in the Indo-Pacific and said that political solutions to conflicts in terms of international law. So I think that's, again, there's a lot of uh, very, very similar to our own position with regard to uh, these conflicts being resolved through dialogue, through discussions, through diplomacy, uh, and the need to restore peace in, in all these conflict uh, areas of the world. So I think, yes, that's a, that's a message, that's a global, that's a, both a, a global, as also it was in the bilateral contract, but it's a global message. And also, uh, somewhere, Prime Minister Narendra Modi also stressed upon uh, the on the reforms which are required in the USA, uh, UNSE and other multilateral institutions, which was pointed out by Prime Minister Narendra Modi today in the press statement. How do you look at the statement in the global context and uh, in the light of current and ongoing situations which are unfolding globally? See, we are all aware that many of these multilateral institutions were crafted in the post-World uh, post War II scenario of the 20th century in the 1940s, 50s, etc. And therefore, they have outlived their, they outlived their, their relevance in the sense they don't reflect ground realities today. They have not kept up with the changing needs of the times. And therefore, today we say we India stands for, while well, we have always been strong supporters of multilateralism, today we stand for reformed multilateralism, starting with, of course, the United Nations and the UN Security Council's expansion in both permanent and non-permanent members. Now, there you know that India and Germany are part of a G4 grouping along with uh, Japan and Brazil, 
for uh, membership and of course the african uh, the representation uh, to be decided by the africans for a for permanent membership of a reformed un security council now we know that many of these multilateral institutions have been have been ineffective in recent times just to give an example there are these conflicts going on in ukraine in the middle east elsewhere where the un security council has proved uh, has proved ineffective the world trade organization is dysfunctional because of the dispute settlement mechanism not working there are crying there is a crying need for reform of the imf and the world bank in terms of the voting and quota shares we saw during the covid pandemic that the world health organization came up short so all these and and many more uh, need uh, reforms the international uh, the multilateral organizations and i think that is what uh, the honorable prime minister clearly spelt out uh, when he said that they don't reflect ground realities and they need to be to be reformed so i think and uh, as i said india and germany are obviously part of uh, of uh, many of these in particularly the un security council where we are part of the g4 grouping and considering the importance of that g4 uh, grouping and the need uh, for the reforms in the unsc and other and other institution institutions of such sort how one can go about it because india and germany are just a part of it but this uh, requires a larger larger agreement a larger grouping to make it possible yeah absolutely that requires a, a a vote of the general assembly for reforms uh two thirds members uh, of the general assembly and uh, also uh in the security council including all the permanent members the veto holding members uh, but the immediate thing is to move to text based negotiations as you as uh, we know that the uh, intergovernmental negotiations going on in the united nations uh, are stuck for a very long time for many many years and there is a need to move to text based negotiation now obviously that requires a particular um, consensus but i think uh, while those are larger issues and uh, need to bring on board uh, the permanent uh, permanent veto wielding members of the uh, of the united nations and the vast majority of other countries but i think the the point to be noted in today's bilateral context is that it was again reiterated uh, our position was reiterated and i'm sure the germans are also on the same page on this and also one of the highlights that has been of today's uh, presser is that india and germany both are discussing a logistic support agreement also can you tell us the importance of this and how are we looking forward uh, to it well this is yes something while well, we have had as i said a very rich menu of agreement signed today uh, 18 of them we were told including <coughs> excuse me including eight which were exchanged during the pre- with, in the presence of the chancellor and the honorable prime minister this is something for the future now obviously like the fta this is something that we will know but the broad point is that this will certainly also help in terms of uh, of strengthening a bilateral cooperation the logistical support agreement as and when that is negotiated and it comes about Now also Prime Minister Narendra Modi said a statement and I quote a statement here India's youth power will empower Germany's progress unquote and in light of this there was a question uh, during the MEA briefing on the visas and the MEA uh, the foreign secretary said that they are expecting uh, the visa norms the visa process uh, which will be eased down but we are just expecting it uh, have we discussed something uh, like really concrete on this but uh, and also if we have discussed something concrete on this what are the next steps that we are actually expecting from the german side uh, based on different aspects of the on the cooperation basis between both the sides sir no obviously when the germans are talking of uh, the strategy for skill labor skill manpower strategy movement of uh, requirement of talent uh, which is available in india uh so as again the foreign secretary mentioned in the briefing uh, this can only happen if the visas are eased because i mean there's no 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 possibility of travel whether it's students it is it and other professionals it is it is a skilled uh, manpower so obviously this would uh, this is something also again uh, for the future and i'm sure the 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 two sides are engaged on this uh, it's a complicated issue because uh, visa in 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 europe as you know is under the schengen regime it is not a it is not a purely 
bilateral Indo-German issue because uh, this brings in the whole of Schengen countries, which are which are a large number. So that will that is why I think uh, the, the, the this. But the fact that we the Germany has outlined and Germany as one of the major powers. Uh, and the, one of the most uh, the strongest countries in in the European Union has spelt out this skilled manpower uh, strategy of theirs. I think that would be a major input going into the the uh, futuristic uh, visa regime. Uh, and but that will remain to be seen because it will also involve a large number of other countries. All right. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for joining us and bringing us a rounded perspective uh, in uh, understanding and decoding the development that has taken place throughout the day between India and Germany during Olaf Scholz's visit to India. Thank you so much.